All right. Well, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Rachel Dunham. I'm the Community Engagement and Volunteer Coordinator here at the Xerces Society. And today I will be your host. So I'm just going to go over a couple of housekeeping items before I pass it off to the real star of the show today. Um, I guess that's par partially Beatles and also Jennifer. Um, <laughs> But a few things. So if you would like to have captions or a transcript as we go along, I have enabled that. So you can go ahead and click on the CC icon at the bottom of your screen and it will show you a couple of options to see the captions. And then when you leave today, an evaluation will pop up at the end of the webinar. You have a few moments to fill that out. We would appreciate it. It helps us to best understand who is coming to these webinars and also get an idea of what topics you might be interested in hearing about next. And then lastly, at the end of this presentation, we will have time for questions. We ask that instead of putting questions in the chat, you use that Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. That helps us best organize um, the questions that we have for our speakers. So without further ado, I want to welcome Jennifer Hopwood, who is one of our senior pollinator conservation specialists here at the Xerces Society, um, talking about a really exciting topic that we haven't really focused on um, too much by themselves, and that's beetles. So Jennifer, thank you for joining us today. I will go ahead and pass it off to you. Yeah, thanks so much, Rachel. And thanks to all of you for being here today. I'm really excited that we get this time and space to talk about, to talk about beetles. It's gonna be really fun, I hope. <clears throat> Let's see. All right, just a quick bit of background about the Xerces Society. We're a nonprofit conservation organization. We protect invertebrates and their habitat. We've been around for over 50 years. We approach conservation from several different angles. We're involved in on the ground habitat restoration. We collaborate with researchers. We work with community scientists and we're involved in education and outreach. And we work across a variety of landscapes. Our main office is in Portland, Oregon, but we have remote staff in, I think, around 24 states. Um, I'm based in the central part of the nation. I'm in Omaha, Nebraska. And Cersei focuses on insects and invertebrates because they're the little things that run the world. Um, when people think of insects, usually they think of insects that cause us harm, maybe they damage our crops, or they transmit diseases, or maybe they're just like a nuisance. But that's just a really small fraction overall of the diversity of insects on the planet. By and large, the vast majority are either beneficial to us or important to food webs and, and the rest of life on our planet. And today we get to focus in on a particular group of insects, the beetles. And this is a, a really fun group of insects. It has, um, it's such a diverse group and the beetles have so many different roles that you can have a lot of beetles in a small area. So whatever your space looks like, you have beetles and you could have really common beetles and you can have some really unusual beetles as well. And just pictured here is on the, the more unusual side of beetles. It's a parasitoid of cicada nymphs that I found in my yard this fall. So one of my first goals for today is that hopefully we all learn something new to appreciate about this group of insects. We're also going to talk about the different roles the beetles play, and we're going to learn about prominent groups of beetles and talk about factors that impact their, their health and their populations, and then wrap up talking about ways that you can support beetles in your space and, and beyond. And just the core background about beetles, they are insects. They have three body regions, head, thorax, abdomen. They have six legs, one pair of antenna, and they have two wings, two, two pairs of wings. And they're, they're all in the order Coleoptera. And that Coleoptera, that name has its origins um, in Greek, which means translated sheath wing. And um, what unites beetles is that they all have hardened forewings or leathery forewings. So their, their second pair of wings, the one that they use for flight, the really delicate membranous pair, those are folded up underneath this protective sheath, this covering that they have, their, their thickened forewings. So I've heard one entomologist refer to this group as 
um, beetles that are they're equipped to go from a tank to an airplane. They're really well protected and they can still fly and, and travel long distances. And um, beetles like other insects and other arthropods have an exoskeleton on the outside of their body. So in order to grow larger, they have to shed that exoskeleton regularly and they go through um, processes where they, they do that. Beetles undergo metamorphosis in four different stages. Uh, they start out with an egg, um, then they transform into a larva and the larva usually consumes some form of food and then enter a resting phase in the pupil stage where they rearrange their body tissues and then emerge as the adult that we're most familiar with. Usually the adults and larvae feed on different food sources and might be found in different habitats too. So beetles in particular um, come in many shapes, sizes, and colors because they're a hugely diverse group of animals. There's about 400,000 species on the planet that we know of. These are known to science. So that's about 40,000, 40, excuse me, 40% 40 of all insect species. <laughs> so almost half of all insects are beetles. But even more mind-blowingly, the beetles make up 25% of all animal species. So they're just hugely diverse. Um, and we're still discovering new species every single year. So it's most likely the beetles are the most diverse group of animals on the planet, even though if you talk to a fly biologist or a wasp biologist that they might try to convince you otherwise. Um, but I think beetles are still going to edge them out. So you can see from this picture that they are very colorful or, or can be very drab. It can um, be very small, very large. Their range in sizes is comparable to like the tiniest little shrew a mammal to blue whales. So they can be extremely small and extremely large as far as insects go. And you can also see from this picture that, you know, they have these armored bodies. They also have chewing mouth parts oftentimes and specialized appendages. And these are all features that really help them to conquer a wider array of habitats. You can find them in freshwater, sandy beaches, um, farms, parks, yards, woodlands, sand hills. You can find them deep underground. You can find them in caves. You can find them at high elevations. They live on every continent except Antarctica. And they, you cannot find them in the ocean, but otherwise they're everywhere. And they've been um, inspiring people for as long as there have been people. <laughs> <laughs> um, for example, the ancient Egyptians really um, ascribed a lot of religious and symbolic significance to scarab beetles, uh, just for example, um, but other beetles have been a source of art and jewelry. Scientists have been inspired as well by the wonder that beetles um, induce. For example, Charles Darwin was a big beetle enthusiast. Um, one of my favorite stories from his autobiography is that he was out collecting beetles one day and really got enamored by several that he saw that he'd never collected before. And as his method of collecting was to grab them with his hands, he didn't have nets or jars on hand. So he had one beetle in one hand and one in another. He found a third beetle that he really, really wanted. And so rather than put one down, he popped one in his mouth to reach for the third Unfortunately, the one that he popped in his mouth um, was a beetle that in, ejects burning liquid as a defense mechanism. <laughs> so he spit out the beetle and lost all three. Um, but to him, this is a story that he told to just illustrate how excited he got about these animals. And beetles have inspired, in modern times, they've inspired structural engineers and um, have helped improve LED lights by learning more about firefly lanterns and so on. So they have a lot of value and intrinsic value as well. But they also have really important and divorce, diverse roles in ecosystems. They are herbivores, they are predators, they're pollinators, and they are decomposers. 
And we're just going to walk through some of the most abundant and important groups of beetles and each that provide each of these different types of services. I'm going to start with the herbivores. These are beetles that eat plant material. They eat roots, stems, leaves, seeds, flowers, all parts of the plant. And some of these beetles are species specific, meaning that they feed on just one species of plant. Others might feed on related plants. And then even on the other end of the spectrum are beetles that feed on multiple families of plants, maybe just about anything you can think of. And feeding by herbivorous beetles can sometimes be perceived as a negative. You know, they're eating plants. And sometimes that can look um, a little unseemly, um, but really it's helpful from an ecological perspective for a couple of reasons. One, they keep certain plants from becoming overabundant in plant communities. And two, because these beetles become food sources themselves. They take that energy from plants and then they're eaten as an energy source for other wildlife, like other arthropods or mammals or amphibians, or um, like the bird you see here who's feeding her baby a beetle larva. 89% of birds in North America feed their young insects. So beetles are one of a, a number of really important food sources for, for other animals, larger wildlife that we really value and treasure. So a couple of the key groups of herbivorous beetles uh, include weevils. And this is a easily recognizable group of beetles because they have this really elongate snout. And at the end of their snout are chewing mandibles. So they can stick their snout into places that other beetles can't reach and then they can gnaw away to their heart's content like inside a seed or inside a crevice of wood or bark or fruit. Um, and weevils are really diverse. And this is probably going to become something you hear me say a lot, a lot, a lot throughout this presentation because <laughs> there's so many groups with so many species, but, but weevils in particular are a really large group. There's more weevils on the planet than there are vertebrates. So it's just mind blowing, 60,000 species of weevils out there. Um, and they feed on all parts of plants, stem, seeds, roots, and so forth. Some live inside the fruits. Um, and some can be really serious economic pests. Um, you probably heard of the bull weevil. It's a weevil that feeds on cotton buds and has caused um, a lot of economic damage over the years. But the majority of species feed on native plants or in some cases attack noxious weeds, which can help um, reduce the populations of, of those noxious species. The next group of herbivores are leaf beetles. <clears throat> this is the Chrysomelid family and it's also very diverse. And <clears throat> what makes this family a little bit unique is that their beetle species all look different from each other. They have certain physical characteristics that unite them, but they're very obscure. Um, you can see it just on the two pictures shown here, these two beetles don't look like they have much in common. So it's a very variable group. Um, but they tend to eat foliage, the adults do, and then the young, the larvae are found on roots or inside buds or, or um, inside shoots as well. And this is a group too that can have economic impacts. Um, this is the group the Colorado potato beetle uh, belongs to and other um, leaf beetles that feed on cucurbits. Um, so it, it definitely includes some pests also. And then next up are the scarab beetles. This is a group of beetles that have oval bodies. They have clubbed antenna um, that you can see in these pictures and they have these scalloped legs that they use for digging sometimes. Most of these beetles um, feed as adults on um, stems or on flowers and the larvae are underground feeding on roots of grasses typically. And some really familiar species might be June beetles pictured here. They, anyway, I remember as a kid, you know, having my light on at night and they would bump up against the screen, making really loud noises <laughs> attracted to the light at night. Um, or other familiar members of this family are the introduced Japanese beetle that really defoliates plants really quickly. 
Our next group of beetles are predatory beetles. So these are beetles that hunt or um, wait to find their prey and they eat other insects typically or invertebrates. And this is a really important group um, ecologically um, because they help keep other populations of animals in check. Um, there's a really nice quote from Robert Metcalf, an entomologist, and he says that the greatest single factor that prevents insects from overwhelming the rest of the world is the internecine warfare which they carry out amongst themselves. So they're always <laughs> they're always trying to um, keep each other in check. But this this role that these predatory beetles play um, occurs in all landscapes, including agricultural landscapes, and they can be really economically valuable. Uh, by controlling crop pests and other pests that um, contribute to economic damage. So overall, um, wild insects that provide biological control contribute four to $12 billion worth in uh, eco ecosystem services in controlling pests every year in the US. So economically, it's very substantial as well as ecologically. And some of the groups, of predators might be really familiar to you, especially this group, lady beetles, also known as ladybugs. They have, the adults have these round convex bodies. They're red, often with mostly, many are red, most many are red with black spots. Um, the larvae look a little bit like kind of tough alligators with spikes on their back. Um, both the larval stage and adult stage are predatory. Um, some have preferred prey. So some species of lady beetles prefer white flies, others prefer scales or aphids or mealybugs. And the adult females, they seek out um, high quality habitat to lay their eggs. They don't just find prey anywhere to lay their eggs nearby. They really prefer to have sources of pollen and nectar nearby too, because pollen is an important protein source for them that helps them have longer lives or have higher quality eggs. So habitat overall is important for this group. And um, it's such a well-known and well-beloved group because it's historically had very, a lot of importance in biocontrol of, of um, crops. And this group overwinters as adults in leaf litter or under bark. Another group of predatory beetles are soldier beetles. And um, like lady beetles, the larvae are predatory. And you can see them on the bottom here in this picture, it's eating insect eggs, but they hunt other things too, larvae of other insects and aphids in larger things like snails and slugs even. The adults have these leathery wing covers and they're, um, some are predatory and some are um, stick to just eating pollen and nectar on flowers. So they can be very common to see on flowers. And like lady beetles, they overwinter in leaf litter or um, in the soil layer, soil layer. And they do superficially resemble this next group, fireflies, also known as lightning bugs um, that have leathery wing covers. And a quick way to tell fireflies apart from soldier beetles are that fireflies, of course, have luminous segments. Most, most species do. Uh, the adults use those luminous segments to flash to attract mates. The larvae also have luminous segments, and it's the larval stage that are typically the predatory stage. They hunt in the soil, the top soil layer, um, or in leaf litter and they are really good at hunting. They'll follow snail trails and slug trails to find prey. They'll search earthworm burrows. Um, they'll pull out caterpillars from underground. They're really voracious and important predators. And like some of these other groups, the soil is important for them for overwintering. And I mentioned, of course, that they've got these bioluminescent courtship displays they use flashes to attract mates and can have intricate displays. And it's a really charismatic group. It's well beloved by people of all ages. I have, you know, cherished memories of chasing these around in the yard at night when I was a kid. So if you'd like to learn more about this group, there's a webinar coming up next month on imperil fireflies through Xerces that I really recommend. It's going to be really great. Our next group are tiger beetles and the adults 
have really prominent eyes. They have excellent, excellent eyesight, um, unfortunately for entomologists who want to try to collect them. Um, they usually have really smooth wing covers and they're metallic. This is a group of beetles that moves very fast. The adults um, run really quickly. And um, in fact, the fastest running insect on the planet is a species of tiger beetle. The adults are predatory on the soil surface and they hunt and catch their prey, but their larvae live underground. And you can see in this really beautiful illustration um, that they attach themselves inside their burrow and they have a flattened head that sort of looks like, you know, from the soil surface, not much. So it looks like a cap to some degree. And they just sit and wait for a uh, prey to come by and then they snatch it and pull it into their burrow. And um, their larvae are long lived, two to three years to develop. So tiger beetles are a long lived group. Ground beetles are also important predators and um, they are not colorful typically, um, but they, they are closely related to tiger beetles. So typically they're more brown and black and they have ridged wing covers, but they also can be fast hunters and um, the adults are predatory as well as the larva, but the larva are hunters rather than sit and wait predators. Um, this group eats prey like slugs and snails, so larger mollusks, and they also will uh, eat grasshoppers and crickets, larger beetles, caterpillars, those type of things. And it's a really important group in crop pest control. Um, but this group also contains some species that help with um, decomposition of plant material, and they also eat weed seeds, so they can be really beneficial on farms. And they overwinter in grass clumps and in the leaf litter. We'll talk a little bit more about their overwintering habitat later too. And I just wanna wrap up the predators by touching upon a group of beetles that live in freshwater, these aquatic beetles. Many of them are predatory. They have really streamlined bodies, oval shaped. They can be really fast swimmers and divers. Um, some live underwater all the time um, while others um, will live underwater as larvae and then spend their pupal stage out of water and then return back as adults. And they feed on um, aquatic invertebrates, aquatic insects or terrestrial insects that drop on the water. And they're able to live in water. Um, they, they still breathe oxygen, but they have various strategies of uh, breathing air underwater. So they either come to the surface and breathe and pull in air, or they have a, a film of air around their entire body that encases their entire body that allows them to stay down for very long periods of time, or some trap a bubble under their wings to store oxygen. And um, somehow that bubble can exchange oxygen with the water. So they have this more fairly constant supply of oxygen. So this is a really important ecological group in freshwater systems. All right, so that takes us to our next group of beetles, the decomposers. And these are beetles that consume dead plant material or dead animal tissues or fungi. And they are really important in the decomposition process. They help breaking down all these different types of tissues and um, are critical for the recycling of nutrients. Their work helps to facilitate bacteria and other microorganisms that further break down tissues. And so they're very, very important to soil health. And our first group to touch on are the dung beetles. This is, of course, a really well-known and well-beloved group. They have oval bodies, clubbed antenna, and scalloped legs. They are related to those scarab beetles, the herbivorous scarab beetles I mentioned earlier. And their larvae are in that C shape also. Um, dung beetle larvae are found within dung or within a nest that has dung. The adults are excellent flyers and excellent at detecting dung. So um, when that dung lands on the ground, they can find it really quickly, sometimes within minutes, um, and can remove it fairly quickly too. So this decomposition of dung is a really important process. It's 
really valuable, especially economically to grazing operations. Anytime we have livestock, um, it can be really important because the removal of dung and the decomposition of dung improves the palatability of forage. Um, cows, often if you've got a dung paddy, for example, will avoid foraging in a certain distance within that dung paddy. So you incorporate that dung and suddenly these plants have more nutrients and they can grow more and cattle are able to eat more. But dung beetles are also really important in reducing habitat for parasites that impact livestock like screwworm and hornworm that develop within dung. So if dung beetles can get to it first and break it down, then you have fewer parasites. And they also disrupt the dung feeding of um, flies that carry E. coli. So on farms where you've got dung beetles, you, you have a reduced spread of foodborne pathogens. So that can be really important as well. And there are really three, just really quickly, three strategies for securing dung. And it's gonna sound funny, but um, dung is a hot commodity out there. There are lots of things competing for dung. And so dung beetles um, have three ways to get that dung. One group lay eggs directly into the dung pat and then try to develop really quickly. Another dig a tunnel below the pat and then move the dung into that tunnel. And then a third rolls it into a ball, which you can see right here taken by um, two volunteers with Circe's, um, Denise Pekka and Ted Kester. Um, and you can see they've got this beautiful round ball of dung that they're moving to their nest. And um, dung beetles have a variety of ways of navigating, <laughs> especially those rollers need a way to find the most efficient route from the source of dung to their nest so they can move that dung really quickly. Um, they use polarized light around the sun, but they can also move down at nighttime using um, the moon, like celestial cues like the moon and even the Milky Way, which is pretty amazing. So insects are constantly doing things that we never imagined they could be capable of. Um, another group of decomposers are burying beetles and carrying beetles, and these um, break down animal material. They're excellent in finding carcasses, um, like dung carrying can also be a hot commodity, a thing that animals fight over, so they have to be quick in finding it. Uh, carrying beetles here on the bottom, those beetles lay their eggs directly in the carrion, and then they have really quick life cycles, um, whereas burying beetles will um, find and pref have preferences on the size of their carcass, usually it's smaller, than the carcass of a carrion beetle, like more like a um, small mammal or birds. They'll dig underneath the body, cause it to sink down, they'll cover it up, and then they will process the, the carrion. So they'll keep it so it doesn't um, rot right away. And they'll um, process it in a way that they feed it to their young. So um, they lay their, their eggs within their little burrow, and then they provide bits of the carcass over time to feed their young, which is a lot of really devoted parental care. It's a little bit unusual in the world of insects. Um, whereas the larvae of carrion beetles, they aren't fed by their parents at all. They wing it on their own in a carrion, in a carrion where there's lots of competition and they have to be a little bit more tough. And in fact, they are, if they encounter other beetle, um, larva or fly larva, they will eat them in addition to the carrion. And decomposition of carrion, just like dung, is really important because there's lots of nutrients in that carrion. And once that breaks down, it can increase soil fertility significantly and influence plants. And there are lots of other groups of beetles that are decomposers, um, including a whole community that exists within fung fungi that I'm not really gonna touch on, but two quick beetles I wanted to highlight for their, their role at decomposing really hard materials. Um, first are the vest beetles, also known as the patent leather beetles. And uh, of course you might notice they're very shiny and black and beautiful. And that's where their common name comes from. These beetles nest in logs and old logs and they create chambers within those logs and little tiny communities, family communities and they provide care for their young, helping them to 
they feed them sort of pre-digested pieces of log because wood is very hard to break down. Um, and they also have ways to communicate them with them. They have 14 different sounds that they make that um, indicate different things to their young. So it's a really, really interesting group of beetles. Um, the next group of decom decomposer beetles are hide beetles or carpet beetles or skin beetles. They clean tissues off of skeletons. So they'll clean off skin or feather or fur or hides or hairs and break down all those materials that are really keratin rich and, and hard to break down. So this is another group that's really important in decomposition. And then our last group of beetles um, that provide ecosystem services are pollinators. And <clears throat> around the world, about 85% of flowering plants rely on some animal, mostly insects, to move pollen between flowers to produce fruits and seeds. And so pollinators are really important in a lot of terrestrial ecosystems because they help maintain plant communities and all the wildlife that depends on those plant communities. And they also contribute to our agricultural food systems. Beetles are one of a number of other insect groups that visit pollen, visit flowers and, and pollinate. Um, but they are thought to be among the first insects that acted as pollinators on flowering plants. They evolved earlier, much earlier than other groups of pollinators like bees or butterflies. So they're a much more ancient group. And um, there are a number of different beetles that visit flowers. Some of these groups we've already talked about already, like fireflies sometimes drink nectar. Our scarab beetles eat pollen or flowers <laughs> or nectar. Sordro beetles eating pollen or nectar. Um, checkered beetles, longhorned beetles, blister beetles. There's a number of groups that visit flowers. And they often have some features that help them transport pollen. Um, they often have small hairs on their body or they have like brushes, um, brushy mandibles. Um, pollen is usually the primary re reward because it's such an important protein source. But of course, some drink nectar or eat the flowers. Uh, in general, beetles are considered fairly messy pollinators because some do just flat out eat the flowers. Um, and are considered less efficient overall because they fly shorter distances or a little bit um, less adept at flying than some other groups and at transferring pollen. Beetles are really attracted to flowers that have an open structure, um, sort of like cup shaped or anything with a platform or little tiny clusters of flowers so that pollen is readily accessible. Um, they might really like flowers that are fairly fragrant, like musky or um, fermented, kind of spicy scents attracted to those types of flowers. Um, beetle pollination is most common in tropical areas, but here in the temperate U.S., some of the plants that are beetle pollinated include uh, magnolias pictured here, magnolia trees, goldenrods, um, and pawpaws. All right, so we're gonna switch, switch gears just a little bit and talk about some of the factors that are influencing beetles around the world. Um, this may have been something that you've noticed, um, but for a number of years, there have been anecdotes about um, insect declines and <clears throat> people have talked about how they'll drive for miles and miles and miles without needing to clean their windshield. Um, and that really represents the fact that there's just fewer abundance of insects in the landscape. And that was, it, anecdotes was all it was for a long time, but within the last eight to 10 years, there have been more studies that um, corroborate those anecdotes. Um, for example, a study in Germany in 2017 found that flying insect biomass in natural areas was down by 70%. Um, over 50 years. So a really significant decline. And although data is not evenly distributed around the world, as we might like it to be, um, what where studies exist, it's demonstrating that 
insect abundance, insect diversity, and biomass is, is decreasing in the places where this is studied. Um, and what about beetles? We don't have a lot of data for most groups of beetles, but um, it looks like for tiger beetles that at least one third of tiger beetles in the US are rare enough to be considered threatened or endangered. And it's also suspected that, that native lady beetles are in decline as well as some species of fireflies. And we do have patchy data because insects are not carefully monitored in US, but the data that we do have, as I mentioned, does point to an ongoing decline and potential collapse of insect populations. And so this really, um, I think is severe enough that, and we as an organization feel that it's severe enough that it warrants action. We need immediate action to try to, to reverse these declines. And some of the drivers of insect population declines are the loss of habitat through intensive farming or suburban and urban development, um, in the spread of invasive species, plants and animals that are displacing native, native species, um, the effects of climate change, the effects of pathogens and disease, and um, widespread pesticide use. And so um, together, all these different factors mean that we're making our spaces um, tidy, you know, we're removing plant diversity, we're cleaning them up, so to speak. Um, but really, that also means that we're making our spaces hostile to insects. And so where do we go from here? Um, we know from uh, literature about conservation biological control and pollinators that habitat is really key and influential for beetle abundance and, and diversity. So um, habitat's really key to restoring insect communities. Um, if you can build it, they will come, and that's true at any scale of habitat. So it's really important to protect existing natural habitat, um, but also to create additional habitat, to restore habitat um, in um, rights of way, on roadsides, on farms, in parks, wherever we can fit it in, in our yards, wherever we can put it, it's important. And habitat for beetles can look like a lot of different things. Um, it can be small habitat by having pots on your porch, or it can be acres of land on a farm. And beetles, because they are so diverse, of course, they have very different needs as we've already reviewed. They have some that feed on prey, some that feed on floral resources, some that need um, decomposing plants or animals, or that eat plants themselves. And so their habitat can be very diverse and you can, you can create habitat for beetles, <laughs> whatever that looks like. Um, but in addition to their food, they also need shelter and overwintering, a place where they are able to survive. Um, the winter. So that might be leaf litter for a lot of different beetles or the upper soil layer or like um, bunch grasses. And that's healthy habitat for beetles. Um, but you have to keep it healthy also to protect it from pesticides. So just a few pictures of what habitat looks like in these different landscapes for beetles. Um, On-farm habitat can be permanent habitat like field borders or hedgerows. <clears throat> it can be this is a, a rows of flowering shrubs on the border of a farm in Idaho. This is um, some native grasses integrated into a farm in California. And these provide sources of food for beetles and also shelter to help them through the winter. And in addition, this habitat helps the farm in other ways. It helps support other pollinators. It helps provide um, protection water, uh, provides erosion control, it's um, really aesthetically pleasing, it can help sequester carbon. There's a lot of good benefits to habitats on farms in addition to supporting um, important beetles. Uh, one really specific habitat feature on farms can be beetle banks. This is a um, this is a raised berm of earth that then is planted with native bunch grasses. And I mentioned earlier that ground beetles really like to overwinter in 
uh, clumps of bunch grasses. So they move into these beetle banks in the winter time, and then in the spring are able to move into the crops really quickly uh, because their habitat is so close to the crops. So they can move in quickly and, and start feeding on those crop pests right away. So for some farmers, the investment of taking that land out of production and installing habitat is really economically worth it. But beetle habitat doesn't have to be on a farm alone. It can be in your yard and it can look like, it can look beautiful and lovely. Like the, this house um, that has water wise plantings that don't require a lot of input um, and have something blooming throughout the growing season. No matter the scale that you're looking at, here are some considerations for selecting plants. Um, it's important to prioritize native plant species flowering shrubs, trees, wildflowers, grasses, um, because many native, um, native, native insect species have specific relationships with specific plants, like herbivorous beetles, for example, pollinating beetles. Um, so prioritizing natives is important to beetles, but also to, of course, other animals in the food chain. They're really, native plants are foundational. You want to make sure you have something blooming throughout the growing season if possible. And um, beetles really prefer flowers with an open structure. So if your goal is to encourage beetles, you can think about um, plants that have a more cup shape that have that sort of platform or clusters of flowers. So milkweeds are really good because they provide a lot of nectar, um, <clears throat> coneflower, coreopsis, and, and so forth. And then grasses, of course, can be really important for overwintering and for shelter, for survival. Um, you've probably heard this before if you've been to a previous webinar of ours, but it can be important to be careful when you're selecting your plants. Um, prioritize um, uh, straight natives whenever you can, wild type natives over um, garden varieties because many garden varieties have been bred for showiness and this can come at the expense of um, pollen and nectar. So some are no longer able to produce pollen and nectar and it can be really hard to predict. So some native cultivars, for example, like a cultivar of echinacea might produce a lot of pollen and nectar whereas some might not. So it can just be very important to, to go for the wild type whenever possible. And um, in addition to plants that provide habitat, it's also important to think about how that habitat is managed because so many beetles have a close relationship with the soil and the ground. Um, some lay eggs in the ground, some overwinter in the soil, some you know, feed in the soil constantly. So uh, management things like tilling or using plastic mulch can really impact their populations. So reduce tillage when possible or move tilled areas around if you're working in an acreage space. Um, limit the use of plastic mulch. Those are all strategies to help uh, keep the soil healthy for beetles. And it can also be really helpful to leave the leaves. Remember probably the broken record of beetles. This beetle group uses the leaf litter layer and this beetle group uses the leaf litter layer. Um, so maintaining um, that layer in the winter time, whether it's under bushes or trees, or it's on your vegetable or flower beds, that's really important overwintering habitat for beetles, um, but also for a number of other really great insects like butterflies, moths, um, perhaps queen bumblebees, and so much more. So leaves are a valuable resource. You can also leave a log. Um, if this is something you wanna do, this is a picture of my yard from a couple of years ago when it looked a little bit more tidy and we have a log tucked away behind the garden. We check it out every once in a while to see what's in it. So you can leave that log behind and it can be habitat. Or if you have a, a dead tree that's not a safety risk, you can leave it standing and it will also provide um, habitat for beetles, but also a variety of other wildlife. <clears throat> so if you've got all this habitat, it's important to think about protecting it from pesticides because pesticides and particularly insecticides can have repercussions for organisms that are, are non-pests. Um, most insects are not pests, uh, but they can be um, equally impacted by pesticides or more impacted. 
And in the case of many beetles, some have long lifespans, something like a ground beetle or tiger beetle lives for three to four years um, and takes a year or two to mature. And so if you kill that population, it can take several years for it to recover. Whereas a pest population can sometimes rebound by the end of the season. It can also be that you um, have secondary pest outbreaks occur once you use a pesticide. So you might use an insecticide that kills ground beetles and then suddenly the pests that the ground beetles had been suppressing like slugs or spider mites might um, have a chance to outbreak because they no longer have that predator keeping them in check. So um, the short story is don't reach for the insecticide bottle right away. Um, reduce the conditions that favor pests. Use other strategies to suppress pests. Um, use integrated pest management to guide when you need to use insecticides if you need to use them, if you reach that, that threshold that requires use. Um, when you do apply them, apply them with care, selecting products that are most targeted to your pest that have short residuals so they're not long lasting, um, that you're applying them to a specific area and so that they don't move off site. And um, under conditions in which they, they, won't, they won't drift. And this could mean that also you, you sort of rethink what damage in your yard looks like. You reframe it, um, especially if, you're, if your space is a yard and you're not um, on a farm with economic thresholds, it's important <laughs> to tolerate the damage because you're, the signs of chewing um, actually means that you're supporting life, you're supporting beetles and all the other things that rely on beetles in your yard. So one other quick thing to talk about with beetles and impacts on beetles is light pollution. Um, artificial light can impact beetles by causing them to move away from habitat or towards artificial light, which can be hazardous and it can also disrupt their mating displays. So whenever possible, reduce your use of artificial light at night during the growing season. Um, so shield lights, um, use it only when you need to or when you need to. So put it on a timer so that it's <clears throat> in use during um, you know, nine to 12 or nine to 11 PM or motion detectors. So it only comes on when it absolutely needs to. So given all of the pressures that beetles face in the world, they really need our help. And I'm gonna take a moment and say that I'm super proud that I made it all the way this far into the presentation and I had no Beatles band references until now um, because I felt like there were many opportunities where I could have injected them. Um, but in all seriousness, we can help beetles by restoring habitat everywhere we live, everywhere we work and everywhere we play. So um, we can work in our own spaces and we can work in our communities. We can help create habitat. We can help provide education about um, managing habitat or share seeds or share plants, or we can help provide information about pesticides and really build community support. And um, that can be um, as simple as just putting out a sign so people understand what your space, what you're doing in your space. You can also get involved in community science. Um, Circe's has a Firefly Atlas project. And as I mentioned earlier, there's going to be a webinar next month that focuses on fireflies and parallel fireflies. So this would be a good time to check that out too. And we also have lots of resources. We have books, um, including the Farming with Soil Life book. You can download for free. Um, the, the two books that deal most with beetles are these two here in the front. And of course, they're, they're um, framed for a farming audience, but the strategies in them can also be scaled down for other landscapes too. And we also have plenty of resources available um, for download free online, including a really nice pocket guide for soil life indicators. Uh, I wanna end by thanking our donors. We're a donor-driven organization and donors support all the work that we do. They're very important. Um, please consider becoming a donor to Xerces. And um, I hope today that this is a snapshot of 
some really amazing beetle life that's out there in the world. And I hope you come away um, feeling like um, you have a sense of how important they are in our lives. They contribute to nutrient cycling. They keep our soils healthy. They keep other organisms in check. They help flowers continue to proliferate. They're food for wildlife and they're, they're influential on a bunch of different cultures throughout hum human history. And um, most importantly, what you do really matters. So um, of course, what you're doing in your space is really important and has direct benefits to your space but it's also important to the larger landscape and to the larger <clears throat> effort of reversing insect declines. And that's really important to us currently, but also to future generations. So um, with that, um, thank you so much for the opportunity to, to speak with you today. And I'm happy to take some questions, Rachel, if, if you think we have time. Yeah, we're going to go a little bit over today, probably by 10 or 15 minutes to try to get through some of these. We have a lot of really good questions. Thank you, everyone, um, for putting those in the Q&A icon. So I'm just going to dive right in. Um, yeah. I had a question in relation to all the invertebrates that are essential to soil health and grassland plant health. Where do dung beetles rank? Okay, that's a good question. Um, pretty high is the short story, <laughs> especially if you're thinking about working, working grasslands, um, rangelands, um, really, really critical. Um, and overall for soil health, it's so hard to rank them because they play these different roles that are all pretty critical, but, um, absolutely really high because they process dung so quickly and in a, in a way that's really efficient. Um, so yeah, they're absolutely critical. That's what I thought you were going to say. <laughs> um, Chev is wondering, they often mistake Japanese beetles for lady beetles. Are Japanese beetle beetles a beneficial insect? Now, are you thinking of um, <clears throat> Japanese beetles that eat vegetation, they're bright green and they're scarab beetles? Or are you thinking of the multicolored Asian lady beetles that are a species of lady beetle that's been introduced and looks a lot like our native ladybugs, lady beetles, just out of curiosity. But but presuming it's the second one, and they look a lot like lady beetles, um, <clears throat> they have some benefits. Those multicolored Asian lady beetles are an introduced species, and they are important predators in soybean and some other crops. But as an introduced species, they're also, they have other ecological consequences. They might be contributing to the decline of some native lady beetle species because they eat lady beetle eggs and larvae. Um, they have other ecological consequences, probably um, influencing other native insects. They can have some downsides for wine producers. They can taint wine. They can be a nuisance in some places. They'll overwinter in houses. Uh, and some will nip people. So they definitely have some downsides. Just in case you were thinking about Japanese beetles that are the leaf feeders, that's an, also an introduced species. And as far as I can tell, they don't have many redeeming qualities. They eat plants um, voraciously. Birds don't really like them very much. Although the longer that they're in a place, bird communities are starting to recognize them as a food source. So hopefully, um, <clears throat> birds will put more pressure on them. Um, but I hope that answered your question. Awesome. So I know that we have a firefly presentation, um, coming up next month. And if anyone tunes into bug banter, which Jennifer, uh, we just launched hers a couple weeks ago on beetles. We are also going to have another whole uh, podcast on light pollution specifically, but Mark was wondering, um, obviously light pollution affects fireflies. Are there other beetles that would benefit from the reduction of light pollution at night? Yeah, a lot of different species would. In fact, um, scarab beetles for sure. Um, gosh, oh, I don't know. All sorts of beetles would because um, they're just sort of pulling them out in, in, you know, fireflies are impacted because of their courtship displays, but these other groups are sort of attracted to lights and using them as sort of a way to help navigate. And so um, that pulls them out of habitat. It can also 
um, just be damaging to them. They'll go to the light and then they'll, they might die. So Arabs are what come to mind, but it's all sorts of beetles that I've, that you can find under lights at night. Um, uh, some dung beetles on the, on the beneficial side. <clears throat> All right, and then a quick clarification when you were going through the different groups of beetles, were those grouped by niche or by taxonomic groupings? Um, so they were housed within niche, but those were taxonomic groupings. So um, each of those slides represented a family of beetles. Um, I'm curious about this question. It's kind of a funny one. Peter wants to know, are there dung beetles in the U.S., specifically in the Midwest, that decompose dog feces? Because <laughs> that's a good question. Um, I've found little tiny dung beetles in my backyard. If that helps, so I think the answer is yes, but probably not as quick as you might like. So continue picking it up. Yeah, definitely. Um, Janet was wondering specifically about best beetles. What are they doing in the winter, or maybe some other beetles? How do they overwinter? Yeah, they're probably overwintering in their logs, I'm pretty sure, because they are, they live multiple years. And so they're just sitting tight. <laughs> a lot of insects that overwinter as adults, um, they sort of just put paws on everything and don't really move very much um, because they need to get their heat from external temperatures in order to be able to move. So they kind of just sit tight. And some have sort of an antifreeze solution in their blood to keep them from freezing solid. Um, yeah. Very cool. Uh, Laya, I believe I'm saying that right, hopefully. Are carrion beetles tricked into pollination in similar ways to carrion flies? Um, not that I know of. Yeah, I don't know if they are, if they're fooled by those flower scents. But, you know, I'm, I'm just not, confident now that I say that I don't think they are but they might be so I'm gonna I'm gonna look that up good question all right so Linda is converting 25 acres from a cornfield to a prairie in northwest Indiana they planted a lot of native grasses and wildflowers, but is there anything they can do specifically to help beetles? I'm sure this would be applicable to other people that have big acreage. Yeah, no, that sounds great right off the bat. Native grasses and native wildflowers, you're going to be helping a lot of different beetles. Um, beetles that rely on grasses to overwinter, beetles that visit flowers for resources, beetles that hunt. Um, yeah, you're providing a lot of habitat. I think one thing you could think about if you wanted to was maybe adding like a, a row of short trees or of shrubs, maybe on the edge, if you're like a, along the road edge perhaps, or if you have a roadside or a um, farm path or near the house, if you have a homestead, that might be a possibility that would just allow you to support different groups of beetles that rely on those plants. Um, otherwise, that's that's great to have that opportunity. Uh, hopefully you'll, you'll be able to see things pretty, pretty fast. That's amazing. All right, Kate has a question. Do you have any tips on how you like to encourage people to plant in support of beetles? while also downplaying the human tendency to villainize them? Such a good question. <laughs> yeah. Um, I guess it starts with um, recognizing beetles maybe. And then the second step would be to um, help people <clears throat> avoid the reaction that, that beetles are automatically scary or bad or, or um, dangerous or harmful in any way or concerning or gross, you know, all those things that sort of stigmatize beetles. Um, they're really just out there doing their thing and doing a lot of important things. And um, I think in some ways, just seeing them, stopping and seeing them can be really helpful. You know, digging even in soil, you can find ground beetles right away and 
um, scarab beetles and firefly larvae. Um, even in just a, a square meter, you can find a lot of different types of beetles. And so I think the first step might just be recognizing what they are and what they can do. Um, but in terms of planting, really you can't go wrong with planting native plants. You're gonna support something <laughs> no matter what plant you plant. <laughs> um, but I do think that if you're looking to uh, you know, attract a certain type of beetle that you're really interested in, um, the soldier beetles like the one pictured here are really charismatic. And so um, asters are really good um, plant to support those. They come out in the fall. Uh, I mean, asters bloom in the fall, but also this is when the adult um, soldier beetles come out too, or this species and its relatives anyway. And that that's a pretty charismatic species. And that's also when you can find adult lady beetles. And that might be your gateway entry beetle for helping people start to learn beetles. Yeah, there's so many misconceptions about them. The story that you told about Darwin just makes me laugh every time that if people are willing to put beetles in their mouth, they're not, I mean, maybe that one wasn't a good example, but in general, they're not harmful. They're so helpful. And the diversity, the number of different types of beetles, it just blows my mind. So there's so in the same way, Rachel. <laughs> um, Elisa has a good question. Actually, in my neck of the woods in Missoula, Montana, definitely is applicable. Do fallen pine needles support beetles and other insects? Um, just the same as leaves do, or are they harmful? Yeah, that's a great question. I don't think they're harmful. I'm guessing that they provide similar insulating pro properties. Um, maybe not quite. I just don't, I actually really don't know. That's a great question. Thanks for asking it. I suspect that um, for sure it provides overwintering habitat for something um, just by the way it, it, uh, the role that pine needles play in forests, for example. Um, but offhand, I really don't, I don't know the, the pine forest community um, in the leaf litter. So that's a great question. I'm writing that one down. I'm gonna look that one up too. <laughs> so Deb has a pesticide um, question that I am gonna throw out there. Deb's requesting that their cropland renters do not use neonicotinoids, but what about fungicides or herbicides? How much impact do they have? And is the, in the, is the impact of herbicides beyond the fields? Um, probably the impact of herbicides used in an agricultural landscape within a field uh, is probably fairly minimal, but um, to say that there's not a lot of research to draw from when it comes to the impacts of fungicides or herbicides on most insects because just the way that our um, our pesticide registration process works is they use um, particular animals, sort of um, fentanyl animals, and they test a particular species. And in the case of terrestrial insects, it's often the honeybee to look for in, impacts to honeybees, but of course honeybees are very different than beetles. Um, and so what is harmful to a honeybee might not be harmful to a beetle and vice versa. Um, so I don't have a lot of direct literature to pull from, um, but usually the impacts of herbicides are greatest um, when they move off site and remove habitat uh, or other non-target plants. Mm -hmm. Um, and I don't know about fungicides. I suspect that that could be a, sort of a case-by-case -case basis. There are some beetles that really do have important relationships with, with um, bacteria and fungi. So, um, but it's likely within an agricultural um, field situation, they probably are not necessarily getting exposed. However, um, some do have microbial gut immunities and that could be impacted by fungicides. So I'm totally speculating at this point, um, but that's my, those are my immediate thoughts. I think um, it would be really helpful to know more about the impacts, especially on things that live in the soil. Um, but I, I just don't, I don't have a lot to draw from right now. Great question. Question. 
Um, Mark said that pines provide acidity to the soil that supports beetles that like acid, acidic soils. So thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> um, this is another good question. We kind of talked a little bit about this in the podcast, but what is an easy way to explain the difference between bugs, I'm assuming true bugs and beetles? Yeah. Um, well, true bugs are their own order. They're all in the order Hemiptera. So um, bug is a, an affectionate term um, that some people use to represent all insects, but entomologists use it to just refer to one uh, taxonomic order, the Hemipterans. And so those bugs have piercing sucky mouth parts and they are summer predatory, many are plant feeders. So they uh, bug in that case refers to that specific group, whereas beetles has its own order, Coleoptera, and they have some of these features that we talked about, those hardened um, wing covers and uh, lots of other diverse um, features. So the term ladybug is an affectionate term and doesn't really um, denote that it is a true bug. Same with lightning bugs. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you for explaining that. Yeah. Amy is wondering if earwigs, which I feel like a lot of people are familiar with, if earwigs are a beetle and if not, what eats them? <laughs> I have an earwig problem, huh? Um, earwigs are not beetles. They are, um, yeah, they're more closely related to true bugs and they are decomposers and, um, sometimes predators and um, birds will eat them and other insects will eat them too. Uh, but there is an introduced species that can be really abundant and can all, in some places reach pest levels. Um, so it would be nice if our native fauna caught up and saw it as a food source quickly. We'll see. Right. Katie is wondering if you can restate the connection of decomposing beetles to soil health. Yeah, decomposing beetles contribute to soil health in a couple different ways. They break down materials like dung and um, keratin rich sources and carrion and wood, all sorts of materials they break down. They, they basically help to take those materials, return the nutrients that's stored in those materials and return it back to the soil. And of course, bacteria and fungi are really important in that role too, um, but it would take bacteria and fungi way longer if they had to do it from scratch without beetles breaking it down into smaller pieces. Um, also, some of these different groups tunnel and burrow in the soil, and that really helps to aerate the soil, to move nutrients between soil layers, and um, to help move water into soil too. So that's important for soil structure also. And um, predatory beetles in the soil, even though they're not decomposers, also contribute to soil health because sometimes they're found down at the deeper layers, but they can influence soil communities <laughs> just by their predation and their tunneling action too. So um, it's really can't be understated how important beetles are for soil. They're really, they're an important group. Yeah, definitely. I know it's like right up your alley. So, <laughs> so I got up. Uh, Carolyn and a couple other people had questions about cicadas. They're hearing that there's going to be massive cicada problems this summer. Is that true? Is it a problem? Should people be worried? Yeah, that's a good question. I think I am not up to speed on my cicadas, but I think that this is the year that the um, 13 year cicada aligns with the emergence of the 17 year cicada in some parts of the eastern US. So that'll mean that cicadas that have been <laughs> biding their time as larvae will emerge in mass. And um, that will just mean that there's a lot of cicadas around for a short period of time. And it's always, you know, it feels, can feel alarming when you see so many cicadas, but really um, those adults that you see. <laughs> just, um, it's a little new, you know, they're emerging all in mass so that they can hopefully avoid predation because there's so many of them that some of them are going to survive if there's lots of predators around. But really those are, they spend most of their time underground when we don't see them. So that's when they're causing um, 
more damage, even though cicadas aren't really super harmful to trees most of the time, but they feed on the roots, sucking up tissues. Speaking of which, cicadas are true bugs and they feed on the, the, the sugars in plant roots over time. Um, but they will emerge and be really noisy with their songs, um, but mostly they will not impact the life of trees uh, by and large. Um, it will mean though you might see some lots of predation on cicadas and my favorite cicada predators are the um, the really large wasps that hunt cicadas and are somehow able to manhandle cicadas which are much larger with them down into their nest and feed to their young. Uh, and then I also had a picture towards the beginning. There's a beetle that parasitizes cicadas also and um, it lays its eggs in the same crevices and trees that cicada eggs are laid in and their larvae drop off the way that cicada larvae do and they follow the cicada larvae down to the roots and then they just feed on the cicada for the, the length of their lifespan. So they can be underground for a year or they can be underground for many years um, and then they'll emerge at the same time as adult cicadas. So I hope that answers your question, but it's not it's not usually a concern. It's just I think it's actually a really amazing phenomenon in some ways, but it can feel alarming because all of a sudden there's just cicadas everywhere. And then you celebrate rather than to panic. <laughs> some people use them to make food. I have never done that, but you could. Yeah. No, it's so interesting. So thank you for sharing that. Um, Christy had a question. Is there a key predator that's been identified that eats the brown marmorated? Am I saying that right? <laughs> Um, I don't know. Um, beetle wise, it would probably need to be earlier in the life cycle when their eggs, um, eggs or larva or nymphs, eggs or nymphs, um, because the brown marmorated stink bug is another true bug and it's an introduced pest and it feeds on plant tissues. Um, I think it would be, <clears throat> it's a big enough insect that I think um, there wouldn't be too many beetle predators at that stage, but certainly on the on the leaves, there could be predators like like these cantharids, the soldier beetles or other um, lady beetles probably that might eat some of their eggs. Um, yeah, and then hopefully birds are learning to eat those adults too. I don't know. These invasive insect species are tough. They're really hard. They can spread quickly and have big impacts. Yeah. I just hope our native animals take it as an opportunity to eat. <laughs> yeah. It's your food. All right. So we have time for a couple more questions. Uh, this is a really good one from Mark. Are there any species of beetles being listed as endangered or threatened? Or are there any that are species of concern? Yeah, there is one beetle um, currently listed um under the endangered species act that's the um, it's a longhorned um uh, elderberry longhorn beetle found in california um and it visits flowers likely as an adult and then lives within the elderberry stem um in terms of other species that might be up and coming you know offhand i don't i don't i can't i can't list any um, but I would suspect that there are some out there. And, you know, I mentioned that there's been a study that's found about that a third of the tiger beetle species in North America could, could reach the criteria for threatened or endangered within their region. So I do suspect that there are a number out there um, and that the issue, the, um, and this is a good question also to hold off and ask. Richard next month with the firefly webinar because he'll be specifically talking about imperiled fireflies. Um, but I do think that there are probably a, um, a couple up and coming species. And now that I am talking this through even more, Xerxes put in a petition several years ago to protect an endangered uh, a firefly that, um, that we suspect should reach the criteria of endangered um, in the East. Um, and so I think that there are probably more that I'm thinking of that have been petitioned or are in the process potentially um, that could um, be listed if the Fish and Wildlife Service 
felt that that was appropriate. So short story, there's only one currently, but probably more to come. Thank you. All right, we have one uh, time for one more question. We're a little bit long, but that's okay. <laughs> um, a couple of people asked about shredding the leaves. Is that a good idea? Not a good idea? What would you recommend? Yeah, that's great. Really great question. Um, so in general, shredding leaves does mean that you're breaking them down into little pieces. That can be really good if you want to leave a layer on your lawn. And I, I do that on, on my lawn. I don't have a lot of lawn because of a fairly small yard, but I do shred leaves because they make a really good nutrient source for the grass. Mm -hmm. um, but I also pile leaves, whole leaves, and um, leave them whole and intact on garden beds, either vegetable gardens or flower gardens or under trees and under shrubs whenever possible, and take leaves from my neighbors if they don't want them to for that same source because they provide a lot more insulation. So Yes, it can be really helpful to shred leaves if your goal is to um, provide mulch to your lawn. And if you want to provide overwintering habitat, it's better to leave the leaves intact. That's a great answer. I've never thought of taking leaves from my neighbor. <laughs> they put them in plastic bags and it drives me crazy. So maybe next year I'll say, hey, can we just have all your leaves, please? <laughs> <laughs> That's a great question. They decompose so quickly here uh, that that yeah. might actually really well thank you Jennifer <laughs> I'm sure. I know I, I think it would be great if we could start to see leaves as the really great natural resource you know a really great natural um, fertilizer and really great habitat mm -hmm. yeah I have to give a shout out he's actually Michael one of our ambassadors I'm not sure if he's still on or not um, but he's an educator he is he'll appreciate this that I want to call it leaf life instead of leaf litter we think of litter as this negative thing but it does give life to so many invertebrates and it is life. <laughs> so uh, leaf life. That's yeah. wonderful. Thank you for that reminder, Michael. <laughs> well, thank you everyone so much. Unfortunately, we have to end, but Jennifer has uh, kindly put her email address up here. If you had a question that's burning that you didn't get answered, feel free to reach out to her. We also on our website have a lot of different email addresses for various topics, whether it's pollinators or fireflies or monarchs. Um, so feel free to utilize that as well. But thank you, Jennifer, so much for your time today. This was such a great presentation. I really enjoyed it. I learned a lot and I know our audience did as well. You're getting lots and lots of comments in the chat and in the Q&A of just thank you for this presentation. So it was really wonderful. Thanks for everybody for being here. Appreciate it, Rachel. Thank you so much. Have a great day, everybody. <laughs>